Good morning, welcome. Good. So, as you remember uh, from last week, Dr. John spoke to us on John 3.16 that God so loved us that he gave Jesus to die in our place and to give us spiritual life through him. Today we focus on one example of how God touched uh, the life of an, an outcast Samaritan woman who was longing for something uh, but could not find anything that would satisfy. The key verses are John chapter 4, 13 to 14. So let's read those together. They're up there. Uh, Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Thank you. Let's start with some prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, you are worthy of all our worship. Oh, Lord, and you are, uh, I believe, present here, O oh God. And I pray that, that through this message, Lord, your name would be glorified and that you would uh, impart to us uh, this living water and uh, really quench the thirst of our souls today. Uh, Lord God, uh, please uh, empower me as your servant, O oh God, and may your name uh, be honored. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, part one, bridging the divide. So let's look first at John chapter 4, 1 to 3, which says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So Jesus was gaining in popularity uh, with the people in the area around Jerusalem. But the amazing thing here is that we don't, uh, there, that unlike a lot of uh, church uh, preachers these days, you know, he was not focusing merely on the vast numbers of followers or about competing with other ministries. Uh, in fact, he knew that the Pharisees would want to kill him out of their jealousy and he didn't want to let this happen before the proper time. So, uh, so that's why he moved on to Galilee. So let's look then at verses 4 to 6. They're up there right there. Um, now, he had to go through Samaria. Uh, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, uh, near the plot of ground uh, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, uh, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. So here it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria on his way up to Galilee. That certainly was the most direct route, uh, as we can see from here. Uh, uh, so, uh, But this wasn't really the route that they would normally take. That a Jewish rabbi wouldn't wouldn't take this route in those days because they dreaded the Samaritans and they despised them. For instance, you know, I mean, I think you can probably think of some some places, <coughs> excuse me, um, around here where you might not drive or you may avoid. Uh, you know, and also maybe there's some people that you aren't that fond of as well. Uh, well, in Jesus' day, there was a sharp division between the Jews of Jerusalem and the Samaritans. Um, and it could not be overlooked by most people. This hostility appeared when the 12 tribes of Israel uh, divided into two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, so uh, there was, that was after the death of uh, the king, uh, king Solomon. So the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and many of the Jews intermarried with foreigners. So they lost their racial purity. The so southern kingdom of Judea, however, uh, was conquered by the Babylonians, that, uh, but their people maintained their racial purity. So out of self-righteousness, uh, the southern Jews despised the Samaritans. 
Uh, they excluded them uh, when they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem in 440 B.C. And as a result, the Samaritans built another temple at Mount Gerizim, but the Jews destroyed it in uh, 128 B.C. And from, from then, they did not associate with each other. So the Jews avoided traveling through Samaria at all costs. But Jesus was different. He passed through Samaria, ignoring human prejudice and barriers. This, indica- this incident d- declares that Jesus is God of all people, not only the God of the Jews, but also the God of the Samaritans. Uh, in Jesus, no human barriers exist. In Jesus, we have reconciliation. And in Jesus, we have peace. This reminds us of Ephesians 2.14 that says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So that was speaking of the the Jews and the Gentiles, that is. So uh, now it says uh, that on, on this journey, Jesus reached the place where Jacob's well was. It was a good thing because Jesus was parched from the heat of the day. And uh, being uh, noon in the desert mountains, you know, that didn't help at all. Uh, so you can imagine just, you know, if there's any time when you've been really, really thirsty, you can think about that time. So look at verse 7. Uh, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? So here uh, we find a very peculiar woman coming to this well. Uh, At first, this woman was coming to the well in the heat of the day. Normally, the women would gather together early in the morning or perhaps in the evening. Um, So so they would do that because they wouldn't want to be out there when the sun was hot. Uh, And they also could, you know, converse as they walked along and socialize. However, this woman appears to have had some struggles with fitting into her society. It's also interesting here that Jesus strikes up a conversation uh, with her. In that day, men and women did not talk with each other uh, normally, or certainly not nearly as much as they do in our culture today. So the the woman immediately starts to object to Jesus' request in um, in saying in verse 9, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. In fact, uh, it also says in the footnote that she could have uh, uh, objected to the fact that Jews and Samaritans do not even uh, want to use the same uh, same dishes, or you know, in this case, the, the jug of water that they were using to draw the water. So here we are. Uh, we are finding that that Jesus, a Jew, bridged that great gulf in reaching this Samaritan woman. In fact, on this journey, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And the word there is there can be used to signify a special appointment by God. <clears throat> <Excuse me>. um, <clears throat> now, Jesus went intentionally to this woman. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'll just clear up. Okay. <laughs> okay, but but why was that? Oh, thank you, John. Uh, but why was that? Well, oh yeah, maybe I need some water too. Okay. <laughs> maybe that happened for a purpose. <laughs> so, so well, uh, later we find uh, that that this woman was living in many adulterous relationships. She. Uh, she was very much at the lowest level of her society, and while the Jews, and while the Jews despised the Samaritans, the Samaritans even were despising this woman. So, you know, you can tell just yeah, at the lowest of the low point for her. She thought that nobody would accept her. In fact, you've heard of the you know, the good Samaritan. So maybe you could consider this woman as the bad Samaritan. Um, Oh, thank you so much, John. (laughs) Uh, Very refreshing. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, we, you know, we also can think about John chapter 3. That's where, you know, we remember Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, who was, his name meant you know, victor of the people. He, you know, he had a large following, he had popularity, good education and wealth, and a high social status. But, you know, so we, we have that example of Jesus meeting with him, but now also we see, you know, this woman had, had none of that that Nicodemus had, but Jesus also went to her. So we can see the spectrum here, that Jesus is willing to go to anybody. So we need to realize here that when it says that for God so loved the world, that means even those people who are not so well known or, or who may not be that likable, there are many divisions amongst the groups of people in our world, you know, be it Democrats and Republicans or uh, older generation versus younger generation or black versus white, or especially in UBF, I think there's that uh, maybe a little bit with Korean ways versus American ways. Um, Jesus set the standard here uh, that we must put aside uh, perceptions and prejudices uh, because God's church does not know those boundaries. All can be a part of God's heavenly family, uh, and we can be a part of the culture of Christ. So what does that, so that does mean indeed, you know, we may need to make some changes uh, in our attitude and in our lifestyle, uh, but let's remember that God loves uh, those people who we may have the hardest time loving. May also Jesus' prayer, uh, you know, in John chapter 17, he said, Father, may, be, may they be one as we are one. May that be true of us. Let's go to the farthest extent to reach those who God is leading us to, just as Jesus did for this Samaritan woman. So part two then, living water. The gift of living water. So Jesus, uh, sorry, uh, let's read uh, verse uh, 10 together. It's up there. Uh, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus wasn't going to let social prejudices drive the conversation. Jesus went right to the point. He points out three significant things here. The gift of God, who he is, and living water. The woman undoubtedly uh, found that answer odd. Um, you know, she wasn't really ready for the, for the depth of a philosophical or spiritual conversation right now. She wanted to know if he had a water bucket and if he was greater than Jacob. She only knew the water from Jacob's well. Jacob's well was recorded to be 135 feet deep or 41 meters. So uh, the water in Jacob's well, you know, it soaked in from, uh, you know, and channeled through uh, the mountains. And so it was nice and fresh. Uh, yet the living water that Jesus gives comes from God. It flows from the throne of God and from the Lamb, as it talks about in Revelation 22. So this woman saw Jesus humanly and no more, but Jesus saw her spiritually and spoke to her of spiritual things, even though uh, she looked most unlikely to talk about spiritual things. So let's also not be afraid to deepen uh, our conversations with friends and coworkers. You know, not merely have the average, you know, water cooler, small talk, uh, but let's be like Jesus by bringing up what really matters. The woman uh, had uh, challenge, challenged whether Jesus was greater than Jacob whom she greatly respected. Could he meet this challenge? Well, let's read again those uh, verses 13 to 14 together. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Thank you. So the woman now must have been quite perplexed and intrigued. What could this living water be? 
Certainly, if the water Jesus could give would quench thirst forever, uh, what an amazing water that would be. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Yet she was still only seeing things from a natural perspective. To understand the definition of what Jesus meant by living water, we must go to John 7, 37 to 39, where it mentions that the living water of Jesus refers to God's Holy Spirit. I'll read that passage to you, which says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, who, uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So the Spirit dwells <coughs> Uh, the, the Holy Spirit dwells now within every believer and seals them for salvation, as it says in Ephesians 1, 13b-14. Uh, when you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So now, it's, now God's Holy Spirit also overflows out of our hearts to reach others with this living water. So, I think the question today is, are you really longing to have the Holy Spirit and that, that living water of Jesus uh, really overflowing from your heart? A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, warns us, I want deliberately to encourage uh, this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present low estate. The staff and uh, the stiff and wooden quality of our religious lives is the result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe to all spiritual growth. So if we have no Jesus, then we are kind of like, you know, like cut flowers that look very good for a moment, and, you know, but fade the next. But when we abide in Jesus, our lives become abundant and fruitful, and Jesus satisfies our souls. So after hearing the word of life from Jesus, the Samaritan woman opened her heart wide. She was like like the deer of uh, Psalm 42, uh, 1, to, 1 to 2a, that says, As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, for, for, thirsts for God, for the living God. So now she really wanted very much to have this living water of Jesus. However, at that time, Jesus needed to bring another matter to the table. Okay, uh, and let's see, so let's, let's look here. So he told her to call her husband and come back. So why would he ask to uh, bring, have her bring her husband? Uh, he was getting at something that she didn't want anyone to know about. This subject was one of, one of her most loathed subjects. In response, she claimed that she had no husband. But was that the truth? So let's read verses 17 to 18 together. Uh, it says, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. It's quite true. Thank you. So the woman was convicted and uh, startled at how Jesus, 
How could he know such a thing? I mean, he certainly was not from the area. So Jesus showed that he knew far more uh, than what a man could know. He knew her sin problem. She wanted to receive living water, but first, the sin problem in her heart must be resolved. She had fallen into adultery, to lust, to idolatry of men. Jesus, however, acted in grace. We must first also come to repentance before we can receive God's living water of eternal life. So knowing, knowing that this living water is the Holy Spirit, we must remember also that it says you know, the Holy Spirit is, is holy, first and foremost. Uh, therefore, using the term living water reminds us of how through God's Spirit we can be purified and cleansed like water washes away dirt. Uh, therefore, repentance, or turning from our sin, is always a requirement to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. He cleanses us and restores our relationship with God, made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Amen. Uh, yet, yet how much, indeed, is our world tarnished by sin? So if we think about this, Jeremiah 2.13, uh, in that God laments at the sins of the Israelites, saying, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So to forsake a God means to leave him, and to dig other cisterns means to seek out the pleasures of this world, Though those things can, they can feel so good, but indeed they certainly always leave us empty. I can testify to the emptiness of this world, uh, but also the nourishing and life-giving water of Jesus. When I was in middle school, I began to stop talking in public. I distanced myself from the social groups uh, in my school and spent all my time at the computer. You know, I, I think at school, I was pretty much an outcast and a social hermit. I made it out that I didn't really need anyone, uh, but in reality, I was just filling that gap with computer games and eventually lust for girls. Uh, indeed, when I, you know, had those things, you know, I, I got them, but they wouldn't, really, they wouldn't really fulfill. And so I always want something else. And so I could tell that they, that they wouldn't really satisfy. Uh, yet, <clears throat> yet by coming to meet Jesus, as I uh, started to take Bible study seriously, I began to realize that those longings uh, can indeed be overcome. It was only when I turned away from those things, you know, like for instance, breaking those game CDs or uh, seeking to live purely, and when I accepted the life that Jesus was calling me to, uh, that I could experience the living water of Jesus. While those temptations, yes, they do try to tug at my heart again and again, uh, but I, I can say indeed, with Christ, there's always a way to overcome. And he is always sufficient uh, for us, indeed. I, he is always sufficient for me. Uh, so indeed, I have satisfaction in Christ that this world cannot offer. And I can trust that the Spirit in me will well up to eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Indeed, God will be our eternal source of life, life an ever-abundant source of living water, as it mentions in Revelation 7, 17. So now let's, let's uh, take some time to to observe how Jesus ministered to this woman and what we can learn from it for helping others in our generation. The progression of Jesus' shepherding is one thing that we can learn from practically. So first, Jesus built a relationship with this woman by breaking down the barriers. When we first reach out to students on the campus, there are all kinds of preconceived ideas and barriers uh, but if we have, what we have is, need to have is the love of Christ and the right, also the right focus 
uh, like Jesus did. And then we can reach anyone. So secondly, also, Jesus offered the gift of God to her. So we too must be able to set out the treasures of God as we study the Bible with others. <clears throat> so third, the woman showed that she, when she wanted the gift of God, and when she showed that, uh, Jesus helped her to realize that the holiness of God is essential, uh, you know, that, that his people are to be holy. So in John 3, we saw that God's light shows us our sin. So that's also what happens through Bible study. As Bible teachers, our purpose must not be just focused on condemnation, uh, but rather repentance and restoration like Jesus had here. For it says that Jesus did not come to condemn, not to come to condemn, but to save the world. The world. So as someone, uh, as someone who is uh, there to care for other people, we must have faith and also patience to be with them, even when they are still hard-hearted and dull to understand. Jesus spent three and a half years with his disciples, and they they still did not understand. That, they needed, that he needed to die and rise again. And they still fought with each other about who was the greatest. So yet the Holy Spirit can indeed change anyone. And he will do so in his time. So we must have faith to act in God's timing. And, and no sooner and no later. So fourth, Jesus helped this woman to overflow with the living water by sharing her faith uh, by, and also by becoming a true worshiper of God who worships in spirit and in truthfulness. So let's come to understand that last, last one a little further now. So part three, true worship. This subject of the woman's many adulterous relationships made her uneasy. So she went back to focusing on the, <clears throat> on the differences between Jews and Samaritans. Yet uh, the good thing is that she brought up worship. Look at verses 19 to 20. It's, she said, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on, on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place that where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus accepted this topic change and discussed about, uh, about worship with her. Jesus explained that salvation is from the Jews, showing that the Messiah, Jesus, has come as a Jew. The teachings that God revealed to the Jews is, is the truth, and it is the way in which we know the living God. The woman also talked about different places of worship, but Jesus focused her on the nature of God. Jesus was ushering in a new era. In the past, worship was very much you know, grounded to that temple site. Yet Jesus was showing that our God is not bound by time or place. Worship is no longer uh, related to a temple location, uh, but it can be anywhere. And in response, Jesus declared in Verses 23 to 24, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and His worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. True worship is about giving our whole being spirit and body, heart and mind. We can worship anywhere, but we cannot have any kind of attitude. We must worship in spirit and in truth. So first, what does it mean to worship God in spirit? Many people worship with the body. You know, they, uh, you know a lot of us may uh, you know, think, think that we have worshiped simply because we have occupied a seat at church on Sunday morning. Uh, but I warn us all, including myself, that attending church meetings does not automatically qualify us as Christians. 
In addition, we must not confuse, uh, you know, just a lot of passionate feeling of, of praise time for worship, uh, because uh, our worship does not originate with the, the soul any more than it originates with the body. So it says here, though, that true worship really must uh, occur when our spirit meets with God and finds itself praising Him for His love, wisdom, beauty, truth, holiness, compassion, mercy, grace, power, and all of His other wonderful attributes. So true worship is when the Spirit, uh, when the Spirit, the immortal and invi invisible part of us, uh, speaks and meets with God, who is immortal and invisible. So may we have that kind of spiritual fellowship with God. Uh, so secondly, what does it mean to worship God in truth? It means that we must approach God honestly. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 8, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So according to Jesus, no worship is true worship unless there is honesty of heart on the part of the worshiper. We indeed can't, we, we must not pretend to worship. Uh, we must worship from the heart, knowing that our hearts are indeed open books uh, in the sight of God. So in fact, you know, I think we can remember that from the, how Jesus knew this, this woman's sins, uh, you know, even before she told. So certainly he could know ours as well. Also, our worship must be in accordance with the teachings of the Word of God, the Bible. To approach God in truth also means that we must approach God through Christ. Uh, for this is God's way to approach Him. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So there is no other way to come to God except through Christ. So also one thing we want to know here, we want to see here too is that, that Jesus calls God Father. So he's showing that we are able to be God's children by faith and the power of the Spirit of God. So you know, I believe Jesus had a vision for this sinful Samaritan woman to become a daughter of God and a true worshiper of God. So let's, uh, let's look then at uh, verses 25 to 26 that says, The woman said, I know that, that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain, explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This woman was looking forward to the Messiah's coming and knew that he would have the answers and would settle the debate about worship. In her heart, she wanted to, you know, to also talk about everything to someone. Uh, you know, she was so lonely. Uh, yet, uh, and she also learned, uh, yearned for someone who uh, could also uh, explain everything to her. But she had found no man like that. So who in the world could do that for her? But amazingly, Jesus, the Messiah, was the one who was, in fact, speaking to her right that moment. Uh, praise God. Uh, so uh, this woman then could find true happiness and satisfaction in Jesus. Jesus is who we need. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, we are eternally satisfied uh, for our spiritual lives. Amen. So I pray that through our time together today, the Holy Spirit uh, would have made clear that his, his will for us to receive and overflow with Jesus' living water, that we would be, you know, springs of water welling up. So first, we must, though, uh, remember these points. Uh, first, we must not let prejudice hinder our ministry to those who God loves. Rather, may we thirst and receive Jesus' living water, the gift of God's Holy Spirit and help Bible students to, to do the same. Let's also remember uh, that we can only receive God's gift of living water by turning away from our sinful ways 
and instead trusting in Jesus, our Messiah. Uh, When we know the overflowing love of Jesus, uh, we can honestly respond to Jesus by worshiping him in spirit and in truth. So like the Samaritan woman, I pray that we also would would hear Jesus' voice speaking to us today, saying, I, the one speaking to you, I am your Savior. I am he. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, that you have sought us out. You have come specifically to us, Lord, even in our our agony of, of no, you know, finding no satisfaction in this world. Uh, Lord, we try and we try and we try, uh, Lord, but it is uh, just to, of no avail. Uh, Lord God, uh, that's because we were meant to worship you. We were meant to uh, overflow with, with your living water and have your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Lord, would you help us to really be true worshipers of you. And, and uh, I pray for anybody who has not yet come to, uh, to personal faith in you, uh, that you would uh, convict uh, their hearts of sin and it would help them to come to know you. Uh, Lord, and also for all of us, uh, Lord, help us to hold firm to uh, you know, this, this gift of God, the Holy Spirit, and that we would ma- make full uh, use of, um, of, of your uh, presence, Holy Spirit, that we would not fall to temptation, we would have victory through and through, oh God. Uh, thank you, God, for hearing our prayers in this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.